Hey everybody, welcome, welcome to the Law Self-Defense Show for Saturday, February 19th, 2022. It's rather an impromptu live stream. Hopefully this will air live over YouTube momentarily as the stream catches up. Come on in and make yourselves comfortable. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the uh, sentencing yesterday of Kim Potter. Okay, and let me take care of this. And we're supposed to be live streaming to rumble as well i guess that's working the first time we're ever live streaming to rumble uh, we do have a law of self-defense rumble account we rarely use but we're trying it out you never know how things are going to work uh, via these internets uh, i don't expect this to be a very long live stream folks not R nick ricada levels uh, i really only have about 10 minutes of substantive stuff to talk about maybe 15 uh, then perhaps I'll share the talk through the 20 minutes or so of the video of Judge Chu sentencing Kim Potter yesterday. Um, of course, I'm happy to answer questions. If you put your questions into super chat form, uh, I'll be sure to go through those before we sign off today. Uh, but basically, I had a window of some open time on a Saturday, uh, needed to record this content anyway. Uh, and uh, so I thought I may as well do uh, do it live as opposed to just a a blank recording so here we are i trust everyone's having a great weekend so far <clears throat> so let's see where are we at well i want to talk about the sentencing of kimberly potter yesterday which i really characterize uh, as the title of this live stream suggests as an ongoing travesty of justice perhaps moderately mitigated by the relative lenity of Judge Chu's sentencing yesterday. Of course, the sentence should have been nothing because the verdict should have been not guilty. <clears throat> but to the extent the jury was misled and improperly convicted Kim Potter, um, at least that problem wasn't compounded by Kim Potter being sentenced to seven or 12 or 14 years in prison as well. So uh, for those who don't know, yesterday, of course, was the sentencing of Kimberly Potter over the shooting death of Dante Wright. This was the taser, taser, taser shooting in which then police officer Potter mistakenly drew her Glock 17 pistol instead of her uh, taser, as she had intended to do. Um, and this, the fact that that was her intention was uncontroverted. Uh, by any party, uh, the state never claimed that Kim Potter intentionally had her pistol in her hand. It was clearly unintentional. When she fired the weapon and heard a discharge, a gunfire, nobody was more surprised than Kim Potter. Uh, and of course, at the time, Dante Wright was not merely walking down the street or driving his car or compliant with a traffic stop. Uh, Miss Potter unintentionally killed Dante Wright as he was violently fighting lawful arrest against three police officers, two of whom were wrestling with him in his car as he tried to speed off. Uh, unfortunately, a jury of Miss Potter's peers misinformed on the relevant law would end up finding her guilty of manslaughter as charged. Now, ultimately, uh, the good news and a bad story uh, Judge Regina Chu sentenced Potter to an effective 14 months in prison, where she'll naturally be kept largely isolated from the general prison population for obvious reasons. Uh, Potter was facing a guideline sentence of about seven years, which could have been greatly extended if Judge Chu had sought to apply the aggravating factors, what Minnesota calls Blakely factors, that were sought by the state prosecutors. In fact, the state improperly, in my opinion, put a lot of evidence that would have been irrelevant um, into the trial in front of the jury, arguing that it applied to these Blakely factors. Ultimately, the state, on the day of sentencing, um, informs the court that, well, we're not going to pursue the Blakely factors after all. Not that it would have helped them in any case, because as we'll see, Judge Chu had already decided that the Blakely factors did not apply. Uh, so perhaps the best that can be said for the sentencing yesterday is that it at least moderately mitigates this ongoing travesty of injustice because, again, Kimberly Potter committed no crime 
and ought to have been convicted of nothing whatever. Indeed, it's worth noting that had Dante Wright's arrest gone only slightly differently, it would have been Dante Wright being sentenced yesterday with victim statements being read by the families of the officers killed when they were dragged by his fleeing vehicle. Now, before we jump into the substance of things, I do want to mention the sponsor of today's show, which is CCW Safe, a provider of legal service memberships, what many people mistakenly call self-defense insurance. In effect, CCW Safe promises to pay their members legal expenses if the member is involved in a use of force event, and those expenses get big, uh, start big and get bigger fast, folks. It's not unusual to spend as much as $200,000 on a self-defense case involving a killing charge before you even get to trial. So if you don't have that kind of money stuffed in a mattress, just in case you're compelled to defend yourself or your family using deadly force, it can be helpful to have a financial partner standing behind you so you can fight that legal fight the way you want it fought, as if the rest of your life depended on it, because really it does. Now, I've looked at all the companies that provide this kind of service. I found that CCW Safe is by far the best fit for me. I'm personally a member. My wife, Emily, is a member. Whether they're the best fit for you is something only you can decide, but I do urge you to take a look at what they have to offer by pointing your browser after the live show uh, to lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. And if you do decide to become a member there, you can save 10% off your membership with the discount code LOSD10. That's LOSD for Law of Self-Defense, followed by the number 10 at that URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. Okay, so let's get back to Kim Potter. Uh, first of all, let's acknowledge that Dante Wright's death was an undesirable outcome in his arrest. That's incontrovertible. Nobody was happy that Dante Wright died, certainly not Kim Potter. But unfortunate deaths do not automatically carry criminal liability. Our society purports to demand criminal intent before punishing people with criminal sanction. And there was no criminal intent on the part of Kimberly Potter, period. When harm results because of a mistake or accident or even negligence, compensation may be justified, but criminal sanction is not. Criminal punishment is appropriate only when a person either intentionally commits a criminal act or intentionally disregards a known, substantial, unjustified risk to others created by their own intentional conduct. A person driving at the speed limit down a residential street who strikes an unseen child that dashes into the road from behind a parked car has caused a tragic death, but they're not subject to criminal sanction because the outcome was simply an accident. A person driving modestly over the speed limit, down that same road who strikes and kills a child because their excessive speed just prevented them from stopping in time has also caused a tragic death. But they're not subject to criminal sanction because although they may have been negligent in their modest speeding, their speed was not such that it created a known, substantial, unjustified risk, great risk to others. Civil liability in such a case may be appropriate. That's what negligence is about. But criminal liability is not. Criminal liability does not arrive until a person's conduct is legally reckless. And that's a technical term of art, a legal term of art that means they were aware that their conduct was creating a known, unjustified, and substantial risk of death or serious bodily injuries to others and they deliberately ignored the risk that they had knowingly created. That same driver running over the child, but who did so while drunk, has arguably engaged in reckless conduct. Drunk driving creates a known and definite and unjustified risk of death or serious bodily injury to others, and the intoxicated driver knowingly disregards that risk when he operates the vehicle. And reckless conduct, the intentional disregard of a known unjustified substantial risk of death or serious bodily injury, does warrant criminal punishment. It's undisputed in the case of Kimberly Potter that she was never aware that she had a gun in her hand until she pressed the trigger, heard the loud bang, and unintentionally shot dead Dante Wright. She believed she had a taser 
in her hand. Even the state prosecutors never disputed that point. Because she was not aware that the item in her hand was a gun, she could not know that she was creating a risk of a fatal gunshot wound to right. Because she did not know she was creating a deadly risk, she could not have intentionally ignored that risk of which she was unaware. Because she could not have been intentionally ignoring a, a known unjustified substantial risk, she could not have been engaged in reckless conduct in the legal sense of the term reckless. But in its rebuttal to the jury, the last words the jury would ever hear from either party in the prosecution of Kimberly Potter before they went into deliberations, the state simply misinformed the jury on what a finding of recklessness, and therefore manslaughter, required under the law. The prosecutors told the jury that the state had no obligation to prove that Potter knew she had a gun in her hand, and that the jury could convict Potter of manslaughter based on recklessness, even if she genuinely believed she had merely a taser in her hand. In effect, the prosecution told the jury that they could convict Potter of manslaughter based on conduct that was, at worst, and by the state's own admission, mere negligence. That's not the law in Minnesota or anywhere else in the United States of America. The conduct actually engaged in by Kimberly Potter may well have been negligent, that she should have known she had a gun in her hand and carry civil liability. But as a straightforward matter of law, it cannot be recklessness that she knew she had a gun in her hand because she didn't know she had a gun in her hand and nobody claimed that she did. And it's only that recklessness that carries criminal liability. Now, after the state misled the jury, Judge Chu had the opportunity to correct this misstatement of law by the prosecution when she gave the jury their instructions before deliberations. And indeed, Kim Potter's defense counsel explicitly demanded that the judge do this. Judge Chu refused and allowed the jury to deliberate to a guilty verdict on the basis of the misstatement of law presented to them by the prosecution. This is a travesty of injustice perpetrated by a malicious prosecutor and permitted by a judge who refused to do her job. Now, none of us can read minds, but one cannot help but wonder if in the weeks since Potter's wrongful conviction, Judge Chu realized her failure. Certainly her remarks in sentencing Potter yesterday suggest that possibility. For example, in referencing Potter's conduct in unintentionally shooting Dante Wright, Judge Chu referenced some form of mistake, the word mistake, at least three times. Mere mistakes are not punished as crimes in the United States of America, not even in Minnesota. In contrast, Judge Chu used the term reckless to refer to Potter's conduct only once and stuttered over the term when she used it that one time. A guilty conscience? One wonders. In any case, Kimberly Potter will now go on to serve an effective 14 months in prison. She was formally sentenced by Chu to two years, 24 months, with 16 months to be served in prison and six months on conditional release or probation. Potter had already served about two months in prison, however, and those will be credited to her leaving a remaining prison term of 14 months. So in about April of next year, Kimberly Potter will be released from prison and return to her family, having been wrongfully convicted of a manslaughter charge with no basis in law. Now, I suppose we should all be thankful that at least Judge Chu did not compound her own failure at trial by also subjecting Potter to the much greater prison sentence of many more years that was sought by the state of Minnesota in this case. Now, one side note on that, had Potter received a seven-year sentence or one much greater than that, if the state's aggravating factors had been accepted, it would seem a no-brainer that she would appeal her conviction based as it was on the prosecutor's misstatement of law and the trial judge's failure to correct that misstatement. And I'd like to think that such an appeal would be successful by a wide margin, although, as I always caution, appeals are for losers. In any case, even a successful appeal would take many years itself and would likely simply result in a reversal and the nightmare of the prospect of a second trial. 
Keep in mind, a second trial might once again result in a wrongful conviction, after which Potter might find herself receiving a much lengthier sentence than she did yesterday. So given the effective 14-month sentence handed down by Judge Chu, it would seem to me unlikely that Potter would view an appeal as a welcome prospect, given the risks involved. That being the case, her conviction on a mistaken definition of recklessness will remain on the books, an incentive to future prosecutors to leverage this demonstrable legal error against other defendants who are guilty of no actual crime. And that part of all this sucks. All right, that's about all I have to say on this case for the moment. Let me go through and see if there's any comments that needs to be uh, need to be addressed and then maybe we'll start the video of the actual sentencing itself and see uh see what else comes to mind as we go through that i know there are there are some additional thoughts that are likely to come to mind as we scroll through the video uh, folks there's way too many comments for me to actually read them all for questions if you have a question you'd like watched um uh, answered, I should say. Uh, you need to put it in some kind of super chat form. Um, well, this doesn't. I wonder if the. Uh, I wonder. If the uh, the rumble worked. I don't see. Let's see. Let me just type in comment into Rumble. Let's see if anybody answers. All right. Well, we got plenty of people here in uh, on YouTube for sure. So there are a couple super chats. So Shane, thank you for your super chat contribution. That's much appreciated. Um, I should actually probably. Um, Folks, every time I use this uh, StreamYard live stream function thing on YouTube and elsewhere, it's an opportunity also for me to um, get a little more proficient at the technology. So I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity here and see if I can try the um, Nick Rakaida means of handling super chats. And I think I should be able to. So Shane, thank you very much for your uh, generous super chat. Uh, Shane asks, is there any way they could try to appeal this after she gets out of prison to get the conviction off the books? Um, you know, the, the, the book may be closed on an appeal by that time. I think they would have to give notification of appeal within some, some certain window of time. Um, that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I'm not familiar with the details on that in every jurisdiction in the United States. Certainly Nick would know. Um, but also I would note that, you know, after she's done the 14 months and she's home, um, I don't think, I, I assume she's just going to want to move forward with her life. And frankly, for her and her age and stage in life, um, the felony conviction I'm not sure if it would be worth it to her to get rid of. I know many of us, particularly the gun owners among us, would feel strongly about not having a felony conviction because, of course, it makes you a prohibited person for the purpose of uh, owning and possessing firearms. But Kim may not care about that that much. She may decide she got lucky. It's over. She's going to spend time with her kids and her grandkids and uh, and just move on. It's not really in her interest to do an appeal to fight for the rest of the world who might in the future be subject to the same kind of abuse. So I, I, I do want to make clear that when I say um, this, this misapplication of the law of recklessness could well act as an incentive to other prosecutors in, in Minnesota and elsewhere, they're going to see that this worked in getting a conviction, which is the mission of many prosecutors. So why not try it themselves? Um, it does not, however, have precedential value. Uh, it's not controlling on other courts. No other trial judge has to accept this uh, misapplication of recklessness in their own courts uh, because this was a trial court decision by a trial court judge, not an appellate court decision um, by a, um, a court whose orders decisions would have precedential controlling power 
over other courts. So this is not a precedent in the legal meaning of the word precedent. Um, more colloquially, of course, it does set a precedent that other prosecutors may try to follow, but it's not authoritative law in its own right. I will say when other prosecutors try this, they'll likely reference this case. Uh, if they're arguing to another trial judge, they'll say, well, your honor, your, your respected peer, Judge Chu, she allowed this argument in her court. And if you respect her, you should respect her decision and you should follow the same decision she had clearly, she's thought it through. This is the first time you're being exposed to it. That kind of argument is certainly uh, possible. But again, it would ultimately be at the discretion of that trial judge whether to follow uh, Judge Chu's error here error in my opinion, of course. Um, Doug Murray, thank you for your very, very generous super chat. Asked, do you think Judge Chu gave her a 14-month sentence in order to keep Potter's defense team from appealing her sentence and keeping her from ruling from being overturned? Well, as I said, I, I think it'll have that effect. I don't know if Judge Chu did it for that reason. Um, the, uh, the prosecution may frankly, no matter what they say in public, be happy that this relatively light sentence, given what could have been uh, applied, uh, is likely to disincentivize Potter from pursuing an appeal because I think on the legal merits, there's no question that the conviction should be overturned. Uh, so the, the prosecution may, in fact, be signing uh, sighing a bit of relief uh, that an appeal of this misapplication of law is not likely to happen now. I'm not sure Judge Chu herself was thinking of it. And this wasn't really a ruling on her part. It was it was almost like, uh, you know, in, in, in a football game, when a ref makes a call, a party may be able to, uh, a team may be able to appeal that call. But if a ref doesn't make a call, there's no appeal. This is more of the, the second. Um, Judge Chu didn't so much misstate the law. She simply didn't correct the prosecution's misstatement of law. Now, that could still be appealed as an error, unlike the football analogy, which I guess in that respect was not a very good analogy. Um, th the fact that the judge failed to correct the misstatement of law can certainly be appealed. Uh, I just don't expect that will happen uh, given, given the relatively light sentence. So let's see what happens here. All right. So uh, all of you who are here, I think I've answered the Super Chat question so far. And I think at this point it might be worthwhile to go through the actual uh, sentencing comments and the sentencing itself of Judge Chu yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, the victim statements and the attorney statements or even Kim Potter statements, even though that was only a, her comments were only a few minutes uh, in duration. Um, but Judge Chu's comments, I think, are worth going through. It's only about 16 minutes of video. Of course, we'll we'll pause it and make comments throughout, I guess. That's my tendency. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen it or may have seen it come across on YouTube, but, you know, the 16 minutes of uh, Judge Chu's actual sentencing embedded in three hours of other commentary, let's just focus in on the, the 16 minutes of her sentencing comments. And pay particular attention to every time she says mistake. Because a mistake is not criminal conduct. Uh, she mentions recklessness once in terms of Kim Potter's uh, actual conduct, mentions recklessness once substantively. She separately mentions that Potter was convicted of manslaughter based on recklessness. But when she's describing Potter's own conduct, uh, she mentions it once in passing and stutters over it when she says it then. Uh, perhaps, as I mentioned, a sign of a guilty conscience. So let's pull this screen up. This should work. Audio should play. So let's see what we have here. And now I think I need to hit play over here. Okay, this is this is one of the saddest cases I've had. <clears throat> on my 20 years on the bench. On the one hand, a young man was killed, and on the other, a respected 26-year veteran police officer made a tragic error by pulling her handgun instead of her taser. 
Thank you uh, to everyone who spoke. I am, I have been profoundly moved by the comments of the. So everyone who spoke means uh, the prosecutor spoke, uh, announced he was not going to pursue the aggravating Blakely factors, uh, even though they spent literally days of witness testimony at the trial, introducing Blakely factors in front of the jury. That's not how it should be done. Aggravating factors are not to be considered for purposes of guilt. They should not be shared with the jury prior to the jury delivering a verdict of guilt. After a verdict of guilt has been handed down, if it is, uh, then it's appropriate to argue Blakely factors. Uh, but that's usually done in a post-verdict hearing before the judge. So this is another thing the prosecution did that was really despicable, was poison the waters uh, around Kimberly Potter during the guilt stage of the trial with days of Blakely factor evidence that was uh, merely uh, aggravating uh, type evidence. So that was a mistake. Uh, and now suddenly the prosecu prosecution, which had filed briefs arguing for Blakely factors for an aggravated sentence, announced on the day of sentencing, tells the judge, well, we're, we're not going to pursue that after all. That's really contemptible. Uh, they shouldn't have introduced it during the guilt stage of the trial anyway. But if they were going to do that wrong, uh, then at least follow up afterwards. So it was really for entirely for no purpose at all. Uh, the other people who spoke, of course, were victim statements from Dante Wright's family. And folks, this is a genuine loss for them. Whatever you think of Dante Wright, and I certainly don't think much, he was a bad, bad dude. Uh, whatever you may think of his family, I'm not sure what basis there is to have an opinion there, but they lost a son. They lost a child. They lost a brother. Uh, they feel emotionally about that. But to the extent that they characterize the death of Dante Wright as a murder and an execution is frankly beyond the pale. No one claimed that Kimberly Potter intentionally shot Dante Wright. So that's despicable. That's that's just race mongering at that point. Really contemptible, very divisive, very, very destructive. Um, they're genuine emotional. Uh, um, the tragedy of the loss of their son and their brother, I get it. Anybody would feel that way. Um, the extent to which they, they mischaracterize what happened to make it seem as malicious as possible is, is contemptible. Uh, then we had the defense lawyer, Paul Eng, the lead lawyer. Um, Earl Gray was uh, second chair um, on this trial. Uh, they both did a, a, a very uh, commendable job. I think Earl Gray's closing a trial could have been better than it was, frankly. But for the most part, they did a, a great job, both of them. Uh, they did object to the misstatement of law by the prosecution on rebuttal, this mischaracterization of uh, what recklessness is and what's required for the jury to justly find recklessness. Uh, they, Paul Eng vehemently argued that the judge ought to correct that misstatement of law, and the judge simply decided not to. But Paul Eng uh, spoke um, very powerfully on behalf of his client, Kimberly Potter, had boxes and boxes of letters and cards that had been sent in. He had shared all of those with Judge Chu beforehand. She had received more letters in support of Kimberly Potter herself directly. She said here that she read every single one of those, and uh, perhaps that had an influence on her, her thinking as well. But those are the prior statements she's referencing here. Also, Kim Potter made a statement herself in court, pretty much crying throughout, uh, explaining uh, her how her remorse is perhaps the wrong word, but she certainly feels terribly bad uh, that Dante Wright died at her hand. She never intended to shoot him with a gun. She never intended to cause him death or serious bodily injury. Uh, it, it's it's a genuine tragedy. The question is whether it's a tragedy that ought to carry um, criminal sanction as a result. And of course, as we've already discussed, as our, I've already said, the answer is no. But here we are. Wright family. Dante was very loved. His son has lost a father. And Mr. and Mrs. Wright, I cannot begin to understand the grief of losing a child. I'm so sorry for your loss. So that's Kimberly Potter. That's Earl Kimberly Gray on the left. Potter Paul Eng is on our right off screen. For 26 years as a police officer. She was a respected officer and consistently went over and above the call of duty. She's a wife, 
a mother, an aunt, a granddaughter, a colleague, and a friend to many. In addition to the letters that were forwarded to me by Mr. Ng, I received hundreds and hundreds of letters in her support from colleagues, family, friends, acquaintances, community leaders and members, and even strangers. I read them all. They paint a portrait of a woman who touched a lot of people in a good way. I want to talk briefly about the aggravating factors that were brought up in this case. As I mentioned so, before. So these are those what Minnesota calls Blakely factors. Um, and they're factors like uh, the crime was committed by a police officer who was abusing their authority or created um, an unreasonably high risk of danger to innocent bystanders. Um, they committed the crime. Um, they abused their authority while in uniform, various other factors. And the state argued these factors earlier in the case, filed briefs in support of these factors, introduced a ton of evidence at trial that was not at all relevant to guilt, that was relevant only to Blakely factors, and introduced that evidence in the form of heart-rending testimony in front of the jury, very emotional, uh, prejudicial in the context of guilt testimony, days of it in front of the jury. So the state made a huge push on these Blakely factors and then then pulled back at the last moment, deciding they suddenly didn't want to pursue them for purposes of actual sentencing. Or the state initially took the position Ms. Potter should receive a sentence above the guidelines and filed a brief in support of two aggrava aggravating factors. So the guideline sentence would have been about seven years in this case. And with the Blakely factors, I believe you can as much as double that uh, if they're applied. That's what the state was pursuing. The defense, of course, is arguing for a mitigation of sentence. Uh, ideally, they would have liked all the way down to probation. Of course, no time served at all. Uh, it's very difficult to get when someone's actually died. And a jury has, however mistakenly, returned a verdict of guilty. It's under Blakely. All parties agreed that I would determine whether aggravating factors existed to justify a harsher sentence than that set forth in the guidelines. I feel compelled to address the grounds for that request because they were made public. And I think it is important to note they were not proven in this case. So that was very surprising because uh... In a case involving a police officer accused of an unlawful killing who's found guilty by a jury, normally, especially a cop in uniform, Blakely factors are found and applied. They certainly were in the Derek Chauvin um, case where he was convicted over the death of George Floyd. So his, what would have been a 14-year sentence, I believe, was bumped up to 22 and a half years. Here, the judge is saying those Blakely factors have not been proven by the state. Uh, so even if the state had pursued them, uh, she would not have applied them. Now, in the end, they decided not to pursue them, but even though they're not pursuing, they're no longer relevant to sentencing, I guess in part, she had already done her legal analysis on these Blakely factors and, and wants to share with the community uh, that she found these factors not to have been proven by the state. The state did not meet its burden of proof on the first factor. It is based on defendant causing a greater than normal danger to the passenger in the car and two other officers when she fired. But the shot only hit Dante Wright. The passenger and the officers were not injured by that shot. The cases cited by the state in its brief did not support its position. In fact, they illustrate why, why this case does not involve a greater than normal danger to others. In the Fleming case, he fired a gun six times in a park filled with children. In State versus Omaha, defendant fired numerous shots into two apartment buildings. There is no comparison here. The state also did not meet its burden of proof on the second Blakely factor. Contrary to the state's claims, Kimberly Potter did not abuse her position of authority. In fact, 
It is undisputed Ms. Potter or Officer Potter was in the line of duty and doing her job in attempting to lawfully arrest Dante Wright on the warrant when she mistook her gun for her taser. What's more, she drew her taser legitimately. Again, she mistook her gun for a taser. That's at least the fourth time that Judge Chu mentions the concept of mistake in characterizing uh, Kim Potter's conduct. And mistake is not punishable as a crime. For it to be a crime, it would need to be reckless, meaning she knew she was creating the risk and disregarded that risk. That known, substantial, unjustified risk, she intentionally disregarded it. That's what recklessness means. Recklessness is what's required for a guilty verdict on this charge of reckless manslaughter in this case or on the charge of manslaughter based on reckless handling of a gun there was no recklessness here she did not know she did not know she was creating a known substantial unjustified risk of death or serious bodily harm in the handling of a firearm she simply didn't know now you can say she should have known and that's fair a trained police officer 26 years she should have known that she had pulled her gun instead of a taser. But that's not recklessness under the law. That's negligence. When you should have known you were about to create a harm, that's negligence. That's civil liability. You get sued. You have to pay compensation. Your department gets sued. They have to pay compensation. But it's not a crime because you were not engaged in intentional criminal conduct. To protect a fellow officer on the other side of the vehicle who could have been dragged and seriously injured if the car were to speed away. Officer Potter's conduct clearly was not significantly more serious than that typically involved in the commission of the crime in question, justifying an upward departure. Turning to defendant's requests for a dispositional departure, there is no question that Ms. Potter is extremely remorseful. She showed that today. She showed that um, when it happened. It is also beyond dispute that she is particularly amenable to probation. But the court retains the discretion to make departure decisions independently. The court is not required to depart even where mitigating factors are present. And that's set forth in State versus Birch, 689 Northwest 2nd, 276, affirmed by the Supreme Court, 707 Northwest 2nd, 660. So this had to be a little uh, a tense moment for Kim Potter because the judge just basically identified uh, factors that would be consistent with mitigating the sentence and then said, well, but still it's up to me. It's up to Judge Chu to decide whether a sentence should be aggravated or mitigated. Um, I'm going to make the call. This has been an extremely difficult decision. In making my decision, I look to the purposes of incarceration. There are four. Right? So here's a little uh, in instructional class on the, the four purposes of incarcerating someone in prison under the, uh, the law of Minnesota, but they're, they're pretty standardized. Attribution, incapacitation, deterrence, and rehabilitation. Three of the four would not be served in this case. Incapacitation refers to the physical removal of a convicted person to prevent them from committing future crimes. That is not an issue in this case. Kimberly Potter does not present a danger of future crimes, obviously. Obviously. Um, by the way, folks, if you're just chatting with each other in the comments, that's fine. I encourage you to do that. Pose each other questions and such. Uh, if you want to pose a question to me, you have to do it in super chat form, so I'll see it.
just want to remind everybody of that. Deterrence refers to the prevention of future crime and the idea that those who have committed crimes will be discouraged from reoffending after experiencing punishment. That purpose would not be served here. Rehabilitation is also not a purpose that would justify incarceration in this case. Ms. Potter does not require rehabilitation to become a law-abiding citizen. Retribution or serving time as a way for a convicted person to pay for the harm inflicted on a victim is the sole purpose that applies in this case. And in this case, a young man was killed because Officer Potter was rec reckless. There rightfully should be some accountability. Sentencing guidelines are just that. They are guidelines that inform a judge regarding sentencing for various crimes. They are not set in stone. The court has the discretion to depart from guidelines depending on the particular facts of a case. A downward durational departure is justified if a crime is less onerous than typical. Put another way, if the conduct is significantly less serious than that typically involved in the commission of the crime, sentencing below the guidelines is justified. I find the facts and circumstances here justify a downward departure from the guidelines. First, Officer Potter's conduct was significantly less serious than your typical manslaughter case. The misdemeanor predicate for the manslaughter count was reckless handling or use of a firearm. Here, everybody agrees and the evidence is undisputed that Officer Potter never intended to use her firearm. She mistakenly drew her firearm at all times intending to use her taser. Okay, folks. She didn't know she was pulling her gun. She didn't know she had a gun in her hand until it was too late, until the fatal shot was already fired. It's not a case where she knew she had her gun and decided to ignore that risk. Now, we can imagine that kind of scenario. Uh, by the way, Uncivil Law, I saw you in the comments. I just, uh, if you check the LawTube Twitter DMs, you'll see a link here if you, uh, if you feel like you want to pop in. You're more than welcome. Um, we can imagine a case in which it would have been reckless conduct. Say, for example, that Potter drew her gun, knew she had drawn her gun. Here's on Civil Law. Popped right in. I see you in my DMs. Hey, Kurt, how are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, this, this as, as I'm with you on just the infuriation of it all, because I've seen this before, which tracks my own thinking in terms of the facts of this case. And there is... A distinction between what the jury comes back which is the verdict and the judge does is the judgment the, ju right. the jury doesn't do the judgment they do the verdict and then you can have such a thing as a judgment notwithstanding the verdict which is one of the ways that that distinction is made clear so if the judge is saying all these things and these are uncontested facts as she says that no one thinks that she intended to use her firearm no one you know so forth and so on i'm like Okay, if that's true, in a very literal sense, how are you getting to the judgment of guilty? Can, I, I, I don't understand. Make it make sense, please. Yeah, so we can imagine a scenario in which it could, could have been reckless, right? We can imagine that Kim Potter goes for her taser, comes out with the gun, sees she has the gun, but decides she's going to pretend it's a taser to try yeah. to intimidate Dante Wright into giving up and yells, taser, 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 and then for some reason the gun goes off unintentionally. There, you could argue, she knew with the gun in her hand, she was creating a risk of an unintentional discharge that could kill 
arguably unjustified, and she ignored that risk. The bad outcome happens. That looks like reckless conduct to me. She knew she was ignoring a, uh, a known, substantive, unjustified risk and ignored that risk. But she never knew. She never had the mental state of intentionally ignoring an unjustified risk, which is the minimum requirement for recklessness, uh, simply as a technical legal term of art. Uh, and even the judge in her comments is saying she never knew. She made a mistake. She says mistake at least three or four times in the course of her her 16 minute statement. Yeah. She says reckless once and and stutters when she says it. Like she know her mind, her lawyer mind knows that it doesn't actually fit the circumstances. For 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 those of you who may not uh though, mistake is one of those kind of magic words because it pairs along with justification in sort of a criminal defense sense, or at least it does in my own mind. They're, they're different things, but both can relieve you of criminal liability. We talk about justification, for example, in the case of self-defense, where we talked about it for Kyle Rittenhouse, for example, that's a justification case. Like, I did it, but I had a really good reason. That's justification. Right. Mistake, is, mistake is kind of the other half of that, right? It, a mistake, by its literal terms, means I didn't commit the crime. Right. right. Justification, so example, is, justification, you... justification is I did it, but it's okay. Mistake is I didn't do it. And so if it's mistake, we shouldn't be having this discussion. So mis mistake is an, another state of mind that's not criminal, that relieves you of criminal intent and criminal liability. And a good illustration would be, say you go to one of these restaurants where there's a coat rack by the front door and everyone hangs up their coat. So you do it too. You have your meal. When you leave, you pick up your coat, except it's not your coat. It's an identical coat that belongs to somebody else. Uh, they realize what's happened. They chase you down. They accuse you of theft. You took their coat. In their mind, you took their coat. But theft requires an intent on your part to convert that property, someone else's property, to your use. That's not the mental state you had. Your mental state was you genuinely, mistakenly, but genuinely believed it was your coat. That's not a conversion of someone else's property. Um, so mistake relieves you of criminal liability because it's not a criminal mental state. And just by way of uh, further explanation for anyone who might be slightly confused, this is mistake of fact we're talking about as opposed right. to mistake of law. Yeah. So some people say, well, I didn't know the law, right? I was mistaken about the law. That's not an excuse. You That's have to bad. know the law. Right. But mistake of fact is a, is, is a defense. Yes. Like the, I, I thought it was my coat. I had a genuine belief it was my coat. That's a mistake of fact. I thought it was my coat in fact. I and mean, you, some of us have probably had the experience. I know I have. Yeah. Where you, you, you go shopping, you go back out to the parking lot, you walk up to your car, you open the door, you sit in the car, and then you realize it's not your car, right? There's sure. different stuff in the car. <laughs> I've never gotten to sitting in the car, but I've definitely tried to open cars that aren't mine. Yeah. And like, why isn't the door opening? And then it's like, oh, yeah, it's not my car. So, Yeah. So if if we're saying mistake in any sense of technical, which it seems to be. You'd think a judge in sentencing would be speaking in a technical way. Yeah. So how are you saying mistake simultaneously and criminal liability at the same time right. doesn't compute in my brain? So if she believed in this finding of recklessness, she would be using the term reckless, not mistake, over those, and over and over again. Th those are very different things. So let's see. There were police officers and experts who testified that the use of her taser was reasonable and appropriate under the circumstances circumstances presented for officer safety reasons. The fact she never intended to draw her firearm makes this case less serious than other cases. It makes it not, yeah. Second, the scene was chaotic, tense, and rapidly evolving. Officer Potter was required to make a split second judgment. That constitutes a mitigating circumstance. Finally, unlike other manslaughter one cases, Officer Potter's actions were not driven by personal animosity toward Dante Wright. Instead, she was acting in the line of duty and effectuating a lawful arrest. So here, uh, Judge Chu feels obliged to distinguish this event from the George Floyd event and uh, from the event where a police officer was convicted of manslaughter. Uh, what the hell was that guy's name? Um, Dunn? No. Um, 
Uh, he was in his patrol car responding to a woman who'd called saying she was hearing something like a rape in the alley. And when the woman who'd called 911 approached the patrol car, he just shot her. Um, yeah, across the thing. Yeah, I thought Noor, was... Mohammed Noor. Noor, that's that right. Noor, you got yeah. it. Uh, so she's going to distinguish this from those cases because, of course, in the, in the well, in the j criminal justice system and in the public consciousness, those are both clear cases of unlawful manslaughter. I'm not so sure on Noor, but yeah. Yeah. This case is highly unusual. The other officer cases tried in this court are distinguishable. This is not a cop found guilty of murder for using his knee to pin down a person for nine and a half minutes as he gasped for air. This is not a cop found guilty of manslaughter for intentionally drawing his firearm and shooting across his partner and killing an unarmed woman who appro approached his squad. This is a cop who made a tragic mistake. She drew her firearm thinking it was a taser and ended up killing a young man. Al, how is that not just positive? Ms. Potter, will you please rise? Again, she's describing a mistake, all maybe negligence. And having carefully considered the comments of the family and of both Dante Wright. So to remind everybody, I think the guideline sentence would have been about seven years. Yeah. If the Blakely factors have been applied, I believe it could be as much as double that. So potentially 14 years in prison. That's what she's looking at, waiting for the judge to deliver the sentence. Right. And the comments of Kimberly Potter, as well as the arguments of counsel. It is the sentence and judgment of this court that you shall be committed to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 24 months. You shall serve two thirds of that time or 16 months in prison and a third on supervised release, assuming no disciplinary, disciplinary offenses or conditional release violations. You have credit for 58 days already served Restitution. So 16 months in jail, she's got credit for two months. So she's looking at an effective 14 month sentence. So roughly one twelfth of what she could have been sentenced to had the Blakely factors been considered. And will be reserved. There'll be a fine of $1,000 and a surcharge of $78 to be taken out of prison wages or due within 180 days. You must provide a DNA sample you may not use or possess any firearms, ammunition, or explosives. You have the right to appeal the conviction and sentence. If you are unable to pay the cost of, a, of an appeal, you may apply for leave to appeal at state expense by contacting the state public defender. You may be seated, Ms. Potter. I'd like to make a few parting comments. I recognize there will be those who disagree with the sentence that I granted a significant downward departure does not in any way diminish Dante Wright's life. His life mattered. And to those who disagree and feel a longer prison sentence is appropriate, as difficult as it may be, please try to empathize with Ms. Potter's situation. As This is the please don't burn the city down because of this 14-month uh, sentence line. President Barack Obama once said, Learning to stand in somebody else's shoes 
to see through their eyes. That's how peace begins. And it's up to you to make that. By the way, I heard that Dante Wright's uh, sister got um, uh, uh, detained at the courthouse after this verdict was mm. read. So, so much for peace. What happened? Empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Officer Kimberly Potter was trying to do the right thing. Of all the jobs in public service, police officers have the most difficult one. They must make snap decisions under tense, evolving, and ever-changing circumstances. They risk their lives every single day in public service. Officer Potter made a mistake that ended tragically. Again, it's a mistake. That's not a crime. It's amazing. She never intended to hurt anyone. Her conduct cries out for a sentence significantly below the guidelines. How about zero? Zero sounds pretty good. Okay, thank you. Okay. And that's it for that. Uh, really, really a terrible uh, travesty of injustice in the case of Kimberly Potter. No legal basis for this guilty verdict at all. And given the light sentence, probably not going to be appealed. I mean, if I were in Kimberly Potter's shoes, uh, keep in mind, folks, when you appeal a conviction and it gets reversed, they're not finding you not guilty. They're just sending you back, and the prosecution has the opportunity to retry you, and they may get a wrongful guilty verdict again a second time. And then you go back for sentencing, and you may get a different sentencing than here. Um, so when you could have gotten 14 years and you got 14 months, it may not be worth the risk of going and uh, appealing. Besides which, appeals take years, lots of money, um, and uh, they'll take longer than 14 months. So by the time an appeal would come around, she's done with her sentence. She's back home. She, I would imagine, simply wants to move on with her life at that point. Uh, and I'm not sure it would be worth all the effort and tumult in uh, effort to you know, regain her gun rights and right to vote and so forth. I mean, for, for my money, I'd have to respectfully disagree because the judge just in her own sentencing said there's a whole bunch of apparently uncontested facts, including the word mistake, which I didn't count how many that was used. And yeah, I'd, I'd like to if, think if, if she appealed that a, a reversal yeah. of the conviction would be a no-brainer. I, I think... Um, I, I, they could I, still so retire. I, well, the, prob the problem is if, if those are uncontested facts which apparently there are, then I don't know there's necessarily anything for a jury to do. There's nothing to remand because if it's uncontested, she didn't intend. If it's uncontested, she didn't know. If it's uncontested, it was mistake. But then there's nothing to, there's nothing to, for a jury to do. Sure, but, but they did it this time. They were allowed to do it this time. So you can't be sure they're not going to be allowed to do it next time. I'd appeal it. I can't stand the indignity of it. It's just yeah. so wrong. Of course, the worst part of not appealing it, I mentioned this earlier, was it just it it's obviously known to other prosecutors that this team got away with this and it's going to uh you know be an incentive for them to try the same thing in their own courts. Hey, guess what, folks? We can just misstate the law to the jury and get a conviction, and the judge won't stop us. Which is all the more reason to appeal now to set the precedent so they will hopefully not do that in the future with the specifically this case law in point. But I'm not sure that's a reason that would be compelling to Kim Potter, because yeah. she's the one that would have to endure the uh, the cost and the risk. Okay, and then the other part of the whole sentencing colloquy, colloquy, colloquy thank you, colloquy, the whole thing about the sentence colloquy that confuses me. She says there's multiple reasons to convict people. She says there's four. Fine, I'm familiar with these factors. I normally count like six when I'm doing it in my own head, but fine. We want to say four, fine. The only one that seems to apply is deterrence. We want to deter cops. Okay, fine. Here's my question. What exactly are we deterring them from doing in the future? What do we want them to do in the future differently? What is the, because this is supposed to be 
we do, we part of this is called general deterrence. We want to punish you as an example to others. You rob a store, we punish you. This is a lesson to everyone else not to rob stores. That's part of our motivation. Fine. We're punishing you for what broader message exactly? Right. And if this had been based on recklessness, you could say, all right, we want to deter recklessness, which you can do because that person, in theory, knew what they were doing. They knew they were disregarding a risk. And you can discourage people from doing that. But you right. can't disincentivize people from to not do things they already don't know they're not doing. Yeah. Rec reckless is devil may care, wanton disregard of known or readily perceivable risks with with the knowledge of the risks in place you act in a completely careless way and what exactly where exactly is this being formed the only thing that kind of makes sense sort of as an underlying theory is that the underlying recklessness is in the carrying of the firearm itself because that's the only thing that makes sense because by by using the taser you run the risk that you might make this underlying mistake. There would be that would be the point of recklessness, right? Right. I made a mistake in the selection of the gun versus taser. My recklessness actually goes a step further back than that, though. My recklessness comes from the choice to carry both a taser and a firearm because it was perceivable that that kind of risk could emerge, particularly in a chaotic, dynamic situation, and that kind of mistake would be happened so my recklessness goes earlier and the prosecution but, effectively made that argument at yeah. trial but of course that would mean that every officer carrying a gun and a taser is continuously engaged in reckless conduct which right is obviously so, inane correct correct that's exactly what that would mean it would mean every single officer pretty much in the nation is engaged in continuous reckless constant contact constantly because that's the only way for this legal theory to make any sense is to go you have to go prior to the point of her drawing the thing and where, where else can you go right. and incidentally for whatever it's worth although it's a little bit off point i saw hawaii was trying to make some sort of proposal in in anticipation of the u.s supreme court where they they give out concealed carry permits permits but only if you renewed every i think it was every six months or every year and you had to carry a taser and so forth and so on so just by way of an example that would make every person in hawaii suddenly inherently reckless right so it, i don't I, I think, yeah, I don't, I think you've got to appeal this one. I think right. you've got I mean, to appeal. By, by that standard, for example, a, a classic uh, illustration of recklessness is drunk driving, right? Someone yeah. gets voluntarily intoxicated, right. gets in a car, starts driving. They know drunk driving creates a identified, substantive, unjustified risk of death or grave bodily harm. They ignore, deliberately ignore that risk by driving drunk. That's recklessness. That's different than if someone has a car and they're driving and there's a case of beer in the trunk. And theoretically, if they drank that beer and got intoxicated, uh, they'd create a risk of death or serious bodily injury to others. They're not actually doing that. That's speculative. So their conduct is not yet reckless. However, theoretically possible, it might become reckless if their conduct changes in some way in the future. I, I wonder if Judge Chu herself thinks in some sort of subjective sense that what she's doing makes sense. Because I mean, I'm outside her head, and I, I'd like I'd like to think she thinks it makes sense. Because the only other alternative is she knows she doesn't make sense, and she knows she's doing injustice, which is not a conclusion I personally want to reach. I mean, to me, it was such a clear misstatement of law, and it was brought to her attention. I mean, when the when the when the prosecution in rebuttal, which are the last words the jury will hear before they're instructed by the judge and go into deliberations, the last words from either of the adversarial parties, when the when the prosecution plainly misinstructed uh misdescribed what recklessness means to the jury the defense <laughs> went too. crazy of course uh and they demanded that the judge correct this and she simply declined to do that and i don't know if it was a bad moment or she was tired or or what uh but yeah i i said earlier we can't mind read but i can't help but wonder if this much lighter sentence than she could have handed down was in part a reflection of her realizing she she made a mistake, but maybe not having the guts to go all the way to a JNOV and simply discarding the guilty verdict uh, as a judge has the authority to do uh, all the way for fear that obviously she had some concern about repercussions for the city in those last few remarks of hers. Yep.
let's see. Let me go through the super chats here. I'll try to do it Rakeda style. <clears throat> uh, okay, a gun related question. It's not really a gun forum, folks, but I'll answer this one. Um, Shiloh, thank you for your contribution. Ask your opinion MP Shield or Rock Island Arsenal 1911. Looking to buy my first pistol and don't have a ton to throw at it. Uh, folks, I carried a 1911 pistol for 25 years. Uh, I put maybe 100,000 rounds with that gun. It was also my competition gun for that two and a half decades. Uh, I love that pistol. It fires beautifully for me. One of the, my favorite guns I've ever owned in my entire life. But it was a $3,000 gun. So there are 1911s and there are 1911s. If, if you're buying a 1911 for five or 600 bucks, expecting the kind of reliability you want in a defensive firearm, may be an unreasonable expectation. There's a world of difference between a, a $600 1911 and one that's been in the hands of a custom gunsmith who's done all the fitting and all the other things uh, that make that into a well-running machine. Those are not the same guns. Whereas if you buy an M&P Shield or a Glock or any of those Tupperware type guns, uh, a SIG, a 365, a 320, uh, you know, they, they churn them out, little machines, uh, they all work basically the same way. They're very reliable, and they're only five or six hundred bucks. So, uh, if you don't have a lot of money to throw at a gun, I would, you know, always prioritize reliability over everything else. Because if the gun doesn't go bang when you need it, it's just, it's just a heavy object. Other than the Tupperware comment, I would generally agree. I think the MMP Shield is definitely on my short list for recommendations. So I, I, I only hear good things about it. Yeah, so I, I, I've never heard of a bad one. I've seen a lot of bad 1911s. Uh, let's see. Paul, thank you for your super chat. Asks, if the judge had overridden the jury, is that appealable by the state? Well, it, it would be hard. I mean, a judge doesn't have infinite power, uh, but it would have to be what would be called an abuse of discretion. That's a very, very high threshold. It's almost impossible to prove to the satisfaction of an appellate court. So for all practical purposes, it's, it's not really appealable by the state. Uh, besides, what would be the point? They're going to appeal it, and all this other stuff is going to come up on appeal. I think the state doesn't want this to come up on appeal. I, I, I would guess, imagine not. Right. Uh, let's see. Robot Glock asks, so the law in Minnesota after the Potter case allows cops to pull their gun, yell, taser, 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 and shoot a citizen to death and only get 16 months. So this is what I call the child brain understanding of the law, an infantile understanding of the law. No one's saying this. Uh, the law requires... A criminal mental state for criminal liability. Uh, Judge Chu is probably recognizing that here. Kim Potter never intended to hurt anybody. Uh, this was at worst negligence. In my view, there should not be criminal liability at all. To the extent she's getting 14 months, it's a, it's a travesty, except in the context that she could have gotten 12 times that much time. Uh, so the law of Minnesota is if you didn't have a criminal mental state, you ought not be criminally sanctioned. That's the law everywhere. That's why this is a miscarriage of justice everywhere in the United States, I should clarify. Uh, and a super chat from Uncivil Law. That's how I saw you pop on, on the comments. Sorry, I didn't expect to, I only expected to be on 10 or 15 minutes. That's why I didn't share the link initially. But uh, when I realized I was running on as I tend to do. Um, my my streams are never as short as I anticipate them being. So. Yeah. How long have I been on? Hour seven. Holy crap. Hour oh, eight. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alicia Cromie, in your opinion as an is an appeal attempt worthwhile to restore the rights stripped away by a felony conviction? Well, it depends on Kim Potter. Is it worthwhile to her? That's the question. And again, if you appeal and your conviction's reversed, you're subject to retrial, uh, unless they reverse with prejudice, which almost never happens. Um, and, you know, strictly speaking, if it's if it's reversed because, because of this misstatement of manslaughter, so the court, the, the prosecution knows if they retry they're going to have to use a proper definition of recklessness, which means the prospect of getting a conviction should be zero. Uh, but they may do it anyway. They may go through the motions just to either use the process as the punishment or out of pressure from the community. And then Kim Potter is going through another trial. Does she want to spend another couple of her years, even if she's 100% certain it'll result in an acquittal the second time around, going through this again? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it would be worth it to her. Is it worth it in a hypothetical societal benefits sense? Yeah, I would much prefer that this conviction were reversed. Uh, but it's not my call to make. It's Kim Potter's call to make. There's no, you know, amicus brief appeal of Kim Potter's conviction. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alicia Barrett, thank you for your super chat contribution. I guess that's Canadian dollars. Five Canadian dollars. I wonder what that's worth. 
Um, do you think the jury would have come to a different verdict if the Blakely factors were not introduced during the trial? That that should be another grounds for appeal because this was really despicable. Uh, the Blakely factors are relevant only for sentencing aggravation purposes. They're they're on their face prejudicial for any other purpose, for purposes of determining guilt. Those days of the Blakely factor testimony, the hundreds of times we saw Dante Wright's bloody body under a blanket, uh, all of that was only introduced at trial, the prosecution claimed, for Blakely factor purposes. When the defense objected as it being prejudicial, which it clearly was, very emotional uh, evidence cumulatively presented, witness after witness after witness whose testimony was Blakely, nothing but, uh, basically nothing but Blakely factors. Uh, and it, it was allowed in front of the jury, all of it. Of course it influenced them in terms of coming to a guilty verdict. Should never, ever have been permitted. And it's particularly contemptible when at the end, uh, suddenly when it comes to sentencing, the prosecution says, no, nah, we're not going to do it after all. So the only reason the evidence existed in that trial was for its prejudicial effect. Dirty tactic. Uh, Bass says uh, the black box enhancement in the bottom left of the screen, that would be when I was replaying uh, <clears throat> Judge Chu's uh, comments, is more vigorous than this judge. Well, yeah, there was a logo there. I take a different approach to that particular logo than, uh, than Nick does. He's got a more uh, graphic design talent than I do. I just go with uh, with the black box approach. Let me see if that was, whoops, did I screw it up? Let me see if that's uh, maybe, man, I am so bad with this technology. All right, I got to reload the super chats and see if I covered everybody. You, pre you click one wrong button and everything changes. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Anticami. Welcome aboard, Anticami. Thank you for your super chat. Says, nice to see you, Kurt and Andrew. Um, v Sync says, think mommy is setting up for an appeal on purpose or signaling to those in the know with deliberate use of terms of art. Well, I can tell you if Kim Potter had gotten a 14-year sentence, she'd be appealing. And the entire transcript of these comments would, would be in that appeal. Absolutely. Every single word of it. Uh, Jeremy says, could you appeal for a not guilty and not for a new trial? It happens so rarely, it's hardly worth mentioning. It, it would, I guess it could happen here. It could happen where an appellate court could say, listen, if the law is properly defined, no rational jury could come to a verdict of guilty, and therefore we're going to reverse with prejudice. Yeah, that's that what would I'm be saying. Because, you, because you, you apparently have all these factual findings, which are apparently undisputed. So you have the judge saying these are a whole bunch of facts findings. So the Court of Appeals is in a position to say, well, with those facts in play, the answer, yeah. So I think... When, with the law properly applied, no yeah. rational jury could return a verdict of guilty, and therefore there's no role for a jury. Exactly. That's what I think is the... I think I agree with you. It's a rare outcome, but it seems like the more likely outcome here to my mind, but maybe I'm uh, just... Unfortunately, you, you don't know you're going to end up there when you go no, through the true. process, right? So that's, that's true. That's, that's the risk. If they decide to simply reverse for a new trial, then you're going through a new trial, or at least it's up to the discretion of the prosecution whether you do. And obviously, they don't have the interest of the defendant at heart. Uh, let's see. Jonathan, thank you for your super chat, says, though I think Dante Wright was a criminal and shouldn't have resisted and driven off, is there not some grounds for negligence on her part? Absolutely. Absolutely. This looks like textbook negligence to me every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Uh, she's a 26-year officer, a trainer for others. She's been trained repeatedly on taser and gun and the risk of weapons confusion. Sure, it looks like negligence. She should have known that was her gun in her hand and not her taser. But should have known is different than did know. Should have known is negligence. Did know would arguably re be recklessness. So, yeah, I don't think she would have any hope in a civil suit. And, of course, her department the same. I mean, she's an agent of her department, and that's where the money is anyway. So any suit would really be after them. I'm sure they settled. Uh, I can't remember now offhand, but I'm sure there was a multi-million dollar settlement already uh, to the right family. I can't remember if this is one of those trials where they settled in the middle of the trial. I think that was uh, um, the George Floyd case. Or during jury selection, this, this the state suddenly settled, city settled with George Floyd's family. Uh, let's see. Potter was a cop for 26 years, approaching zero probability. She did not do other prison worthy things in those 26 years behind killing Dante Wright. 
Well, again, that's an infantile view of the world. I mean, prove it. That's how our criminal justice system works. You don't just get to speculate that someone engaged in criminal acts and therefore deserves to be in prison. I don't think you want to live in that world. Uh, Robot Glock, same person who did the last Super Chat. And I appreciate the money, but uh, even if she was some rare unicorn, Kim Potter was some unicorn, rare, 100% clean cop. Other cops did bad things in her presence, and she didn't speak up. Like, what? Just, what, what are we even talking about? So she's now criminally liable for all that? Lock her up, send a message to all cops. So she's liable for someone. First of all, there's no evidence of any of this. So, again, it's just cop hate, which is fine. Go ahead. It's a free country, mostly. Uh, let's see. Freer maybe, than Canada. Uh, well, in the moment, for sure. Maybe coming soon to a uh, American city near you. Me Flowers, 66. Uh, thank you for your super chat. Asked, I think she thought she'd get a not guilty, so the light sentence was to appease the family. I think she thought she'd get a not guilty. Oh, Judge Chu. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that. Especially when she allowed the judge, uh, the jury, to be misinstructed on the law. That that put a guilty verdict right on the table. Because if you tell the jury negligence is enough, well, as I just explained, this looks exactly like negligence. So if you tell them negligence is enough for a predicate for manslaughter, well, that's there. That's in the evidence. If that's the law, the problem is that's not the law. Uh, so once she allowed that misstatement of law to go forward, I think a conviction was was unavoidable. Let's see. Bup, 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 bup. Man, I, I begin to understand how uh, how Rakita can uh, end up on on a stream for seven hours. Let's see. As long as you're reading that Griff baby, it's all it's all good, man. I wish I had that more of that problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Manny Aguilar asks, uh, in your opinion, what have been the proper charges to Miss Potter and a fair punishment to what happened? Uh, no charge, no criminal charge. There's no criminal intent here. Criminal intent is required for a criminal charge. The fact that Dante Wright died, and we would have preferred he not die, that it was a tragic death, right? The fact that it was a tragic death does not mean it was a crime. Not all tragic deaths are crimes, uh, especially given the broader context of factors largely not permitted to be considered a trial, like, like his own conduct. I mean, he was violently resisting and presented a deadly force threat to officers making a lawful felony arrest on a gun charge, uh, among other factors. So certainly he contributed to his own demise in his choice of conduct. If he had complied with arrest, he would not be dead. And that wasn't up to Kim Potter. When officers, police officers are using force almost every instance, it's not the cop who's deciding how much force to use. It's the suspect who's deciding how much force to use. And the cop is compelled to use the amount of force necessary to carry out their duty. Are there exceptions? Yes, but they are exceptions. And let's see. I think I think that's it. So I am, of course, can't let everyone leave without a quick grift. So folks, don't forget, you can always get a free copy of my book, The Law of Self-Defense. This is the soft cover. Um, we just ask you to cover the shipping and handling, but we eat the cost of the book. You can get that at lawselfdefense.com slash free book. Uh, if you could hit subscribe, well, you have to subscribe to comment. So I would encourage you to do that. Hit thumbs up, tell your friends and family, do the other things that are supposed to be done on social media. I don't know what they are really, but presumably many of you do to help us grow the law of self-defense community. That is always tremendously appreciated. Uh, Kurt, thank you for coming on. I'll let you know about my rescheduled motorcycle trip down to uh, Texas Hill Country. Uh, it'll probably be delayed a week or two, subject, as always, to weather, which is why I have to delay this time. Um, but uh, I look forward to meeting up and having dinner. Awesome. Sounds like a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on your stream. Of course. All right, folks, with that, I'll sign off. Here's our little exit video. Remember, if you carry a gun so you're hard to kill, you also owe it to yourself to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branker for Law Self-Defense. Stay safe.